So you may have noticed that food, at least naturally occurring food, is rarely blue. Some people would argue that it's never blue. And I wonder why there's no blue food. <laughs> I love you and I miss you, George, but I think these are blue. Yeah, those look blue to me, though if you disagree, that's not because you're wrong. Blue is a somewhat arbitrary social construct. I mean, electromagnetic radiation with a wavelength around 450 nanometers, that is a real thing. That's an objective reality. But deciding to call that blue, that's a thing that humans just made up. And different people have made up very different ways of describing various different chunks of the visible light spectrum. A famous example of this is blue-green co-lexification. Lots of different people in lots of different languages all over the world have historically used the same word to refer to both blue and green. Blue and green are adjacent on the spectrum, after all, but the distinction between blue and green matters a lot to plants, and this helps explain why blue is so rare in food. Plants are usually green, the color of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the stuff that helps plants convert light energy into chemical energy. Delicious, delicious chemical energy. Carbs and such. Plants usually absorb almost all of the blue and red light they get, but for reasons that are still a subject of active scientific investigation, plants usually absorb less of the green light they get. Therefore, some green light just bounces off the plant and goes into our eye. Therefore, the thing looks green to us. It's reflecting green light at us. And in nature, there's really only one kind of stuff that makes plants appear blue. And even then, this stuff more often makes them appear purplish or reddish. All of these tasty plant parts get their distinctive color from anthocyanins. Antho from the Greek word for flowers, and cyanin from the Greek word for dark blue or purple, which is also where we get the word cyan, which in English describes a very different area of the spectrum, the border between blue and green, because while color is an objective reality, the names for colors are just things that people make up. Anyway, anthocyanin. If you ever wonder why a plant is blue or purple, the answer is pretty much always anthocyanin. What is anthocyanin? So anthocyanins are a class of compounds found in pretty much most uh, fruits, vegetables, plants. So that is Pamela Denish. She is a very soon-to-be PhD at UC Davis, and she studies blue food. Legit, that's what she does. And it could make her a very wealthy woman someday pretty soon. We'll get back to that. Staying with anthocyanins. In plants, they serve multiple roles. They serve as an antibacterial as well as kind of like a sunscreen for the plant. Uh, they absorb excess light that could be harmful to the chloroplasts. Um, the chloroplasts can only photosynthesize so much light at a time. And so basically they'll burn with all the excess light if there's no filter. And so anthocyanins kind of filter that light. But just as there are different sunshades that filter different kinds of light, there are different anthocyanins, and depending on which wavelengths they reflect or absorb, they can appear bluish, like this shirt, or reddish, like the logo on it. So there's over, I think, 700 different anthocyanins, and they're all very similar. They all have this uh, signature central, what's called a chromophore. Uh, which is just uh, three cyclical groups, and then attached to that are various sugars and acyl groups. And that core is actually what, how it absorbs light um, through super high-level quantum mechanics. Basically, it allows the electrons to kind of just move around a bunch in this core. And when it absorbs light, those electrons move in a way that reflect color. The particular red to blue that anthocyanins will reflect is also influenced by environmental factors, such as one of my favorites, acidity. At low pH, which is like highly acidic, um, there's excess hydrogen atoms that shift the double bonds in the structure. There's a lot of double bonds in the structure, and it shifts them one direction, and that configuration of electrons and bonds causes it to absorb everything but red, so it reflects red. And then when there's a higher pH, uh, so it's more alkaline or basic, 
it shifts the electrons around in a way that basically they reflect blue instead. So basic equals blue, acidic equals purple going into red. In alkaline conditions, you might get a beautiful blue like we see in these frames from the sponsor of this video, Warby Parker. Let me thank them real quick. I am psychologically capable of trying on something as bold as these glasses only because I'm doing it in the privacy of my home. I just went to warbyparker.com and picked five pairs. They have glasses, prescription sunglasses, contacts, anything. I picked five frames and they mailed them to me totally for free. No shipping no nothing. And there's no obligation to buy, so go crazy. Try something real weird. You might surprise yourself. Then you slap the prepaid return envelope back on the box and you shoot over your lens prescription. If you're near a Warby Parker store, you can even get your eye exam right there. The beautiful glasses you get back start at just $95. Every pair of glasses you've ever seen me wear are Warby Parkers. I was a customer long before they started supporting my channel. If you want to support this channel and do a free home try, on, hit my link in the description, warbyparker.com slash ragusia. Try on five pairs totally free at warbyparker.com slash ragusia. Thank you, Warby Parker. Anyway, we were talking about how acids tend to get you anthocyanins that are reddish purple, and bases tend to get you anthocyanins that are more bluish purple. If you are a gardening enthusiast like myself, you're probably super confused right now. You're thinking, wait a minute, when I want my hydrangeas to be blue instead Instead of purple or pink, I put down soil acidifier, sulfur or aluminum sulfate. Soil acidifier makes hydrangeas blue. Yet we just heard that alkalines equal blue. Well, another thing that influences the color of anthocyanins is the presence of metals. When there's a metal ion present, the anthocyanins actually coordinate around it in kind of a pinwheel configuration and like overlap with each other and form this little like puck of anthocyanins around a metal. And that distorts the shape of the anthocyanin in a way that causes it to reflect blue instead of like red or purple. And in the case of these flowers, it's aluminum ions making them blue instead of purple or pink. These soil acidifiers basically get more aluminum ions into the plant for science reasons. You can see these very complex interactions unfolding as you cook blueberries. At first, they are blue. And don't say blueberries, we know they're purple. Yes, George, depending on variety and growing conditions and such, blueberries might be purple, but I'd call those ones blue. When they really start to cook, though, they go to purple. Then, if you put a big spoonful of baking soda in a base, they go blue again, so dark blue that they start to look black and some yellows start happening that combine with the blues and you get this repulsive green. Crazy stuff happening in there as a result of pH and metal ions and I'm sure other stuff. I don't really understand it. I don't need to understand it. What we need to understand if we desire blue food is that purple is a mixture of red and blue. So if you want something to be more blue than it is red, then you need the blue anthocyanins as opposed to the red ones. And the blue ones are harder to come by in nature. There's just more anthocyanins that are red. Like red is the easiest or the most stable configuration of anthocyanins. So you're just going to see the majority of them in that configuration. Um, a lot fewer number of anthocyanins can assemble in the way that forms blue. Like, so for example, in red cabbage, there are eight anthocyanins and only one of them does this configuration around metals that I was describing. So that's the only one that can be really, really blue. That particular anthocyanin is of great interest to Denish and her colleagues. The food industry has been looking for many years for a natural alternative to blue dye number one, a synthetic colorant used to make 
candies and such. This one anthocyanin in cabbage could do the job, but there's so little of it in there that they'd probably have to plant like the entire Earth's surface in cabbage to derive the desired quantity. So the scientists here have worked out a way to use enzymes to convert other anthocyanins into this one particular anthocyanin that gives you a deep blue that is stable. Stable meaning it won't easily break down or change in response to changing conditions. So Pam Danish over there is working on putting together a company now that will market this technology that creates natural blue food coloring. Study weird niche things, kids. Things like blue foods. A lot of money to be made there. I mean, Pam and friends are still making this colorant in a lab, but the resulting substance is identical to this one anthocyanin found in nature. In that sense, the colorant is natural. I know that matters from like a marketing standpoint. People don't like to buy things that say they have artificial colors in them. But does it actually like matter? Well, maybe a little. Anthocyanins are antioxidants, and there's reason to believe antioxidants are good for you. Maybe prevent cancer and other badness. It has a positive charge, and so it can absorb radicals, which are just like negatively charged groups uh, that can interact with our cells and cause damage, and so it kind of neutralizes those. Anthocyanins do this for the plant, as well as us animals who eat the plant. This may be another reason why plants evolved to have them. Plants may have also evolved to be blue or purple to attract pollinators, like bugs, but evolution is not the only force at work in these foods. No, humans have been genetically manipulating food plants for millennia, right? For example, farmers in South America, ancient farmers in the Andes Mountains, probably noticed that certain potatoes had little streaks of blue in them. Maybe they just thought that was pretty, they just liked it for whatever reason, so they selected for plants that were more purple than others, and many, many generations later, you have blue or purple Peruvian potatoes. I love them. But regardless of how they got in there, the source of the color is anthocyanins. Anytime you see blue or purple in a plant. Red can be anthocyanins, or it can be carotenoids, a similar class of stuff that give you more of an orangish red, like tomatoes. Lycopene is a carotenoid. In the case of the Cherokee purple tomato, my favorite, you've got both anthocyanins and carotenoids going on. Bluishness is anthocyanins in plants. Humans eat things other than plants, right? There are some blue animals, but those colors are usually there as a warning. I'm poisonous. Don't even try to eat me. And then there is blue color in fungi. And remember that fungi are their own thing. They are not animals or plants. And the colorant at work there is a different thing. Blue oyster mushrooms like these or the penicillium mold in this cheese. They're bluish for totally different reasons that may not even be fully understood. Maybe we'll talk about those another day. The ladies always say I have beautiful blue eyes. I'm a Jim Okay.